Thank you. You may be seated. Oh, I'm sorry. Remain standing up. for the word. Oh, dear. <laughs> Dang. Brothers, we are not professionals. <laughs> if you would take your copy of the scriptures uh, and turn to James chapter 2, we'll be reading verses 14 through 19. It's on page 637 in the Pew Bible if you need that. Uh, picking it up at verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which <clears throat> are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. I appreciate all the all the people that are the moving parts around here. I was looking at the the pretty wreaths and flowers and those who attend to such things and been thinking a lot about our elders and the love and care that they have for for us. So I'm grateful. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have us here. Pray that we would receive your word, that you would teach us afresh these verses with which we're familiar. We've heard this before. We, we have our, our understanding in mind. We pray that you teach us afresh. And that you'd be honored by our, our approach and our response to your word. And I pray for myself that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable to you, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. We approach you because of Christ. Amen. Last Sunday, we successfully made it through one verse, but it was a full verse, and it was a major verse for our understanding of faith. Everybody has faith, but specifically the Christian faith, saving faith. The verses which follow verse 14 are examples, and they flow from the understanding of faith that we developed last week as we seek to faithfully learn what James is teaching us, being faithful to his broader message that is communicated through this letter. James is addressing the relationship between faith and works. This is clear, and we'll see that continue today, but we must keep in our minds the whole of James's message. He is addressing the problem of functioning with a divided heart, that which is not full, complete, whole, and in cohesive operation which is representative of God, and it's reflective of his work in the life of a believer. James lovingly identifies the problems that we didn't know existed. And having received that diagnosis, he goes to work prescribing the healing, providing for a sound teaching 
to bring about right belief and that a sound and saving faith would result and produce results consistent with the stated belief. James is not talking about achieving salvation through external expressions. Not in the least. That's a very natural direction to go with this. To just so, okay, we're just gonna go, we're gonna go philanthropic with all this stuff. We're gonna just be really nice. That that's not at all what James is speaking about. He very clearly preaches Jesus Christ as the Savior, and the Savior from our sinful selves, while showing that the work of God should be evident in the life of one who claims to belong to him. It's a rather, it's a rather logical argument, but logic doesn't always get us to where we need to go. James is writing to combat one of the trickiest conditions to diagnose, and that is self-deception. If you're taking notes, self-deception. Also, if you're taking notes, we're not going to get to the end, but now you have a whole week to guess what the other blanks are. Self-deception, which is to be fooled about yourself by yourself. Isn't that interesting? To be fooled about yourself by yourself. I am the one fooling myself. James is addressing the problem of self-deception, and he's trying to help us diagnose this, which is really a, a very tricky, difficult task. We have all had the experience of trying to convey something to someone, to get them to understand something. Uh, it could be a thing where you're looking at something out your window and it's just, and so you run and you're like, hey, 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 you got to see this. And then inevitably, when you come back and they're there with you, it stops happening. You return and find that whatever was so exciting is no longer happening. We all know what it has been to be in a funny situation and you're trying to tell somebody else about it and then you're, you're laughing and then they're looking at you like, none of this is communicating. And so we quickly get to the point where we're like, uh, just forget it, you'd have to be there. Many of us have had the experience where a vehicle or an appliance at the house was just making a terrible noise. And so then we take it to the shop, or when we're standing there in front of the technician, what happens? It stops making the sound, right? And so then we, we sort of, at that point, we find out that our impression of a male toddler is really not up to snuff. Because then we, we go to explaining it. We'd be like, oh, it's sort of like a, and then sometimes when I'm when I'm slowing, it's going. I mean, it's not doing it now, but but if but but if you heard it, you would really understand it. So, what is it that we're trying to communicate through these efforts? We're trying to communicate the actual state of things. If if you saw what I saw you would have agreed, wow, that was amazing. I can't believe we saw that. If, if you were there, then you would have thought it was hilarious too. And, and if you could hear the sound the car was making and if you could feel the vibrations, you would know exactly what I'm talking about because in order for us to really have an accurate understanding of things, we have to see them. We, we have to hear it. We have to experience it ourselves. We need to have a living example. And with unparalleled condescension, that is what God did. In the person of Jesus Christ, James 1.14 describes, and the word became flesh 
and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The limitless God, think about this, the limitless God in tangible form. That almost seems like that's not a sentence that could work. Making himself accessible, relatable, and undeniably real. In his teaching, Jesus Christ did that in providing the example of the Good Samaritan, for example, to communicate what it means to be a neighbor to someone by giving an example that showed what it looked like. And that is what James is doing for us. He presents a concept, and we nod our heads and we say, okay. And then he gives us an example of what he's talking about so that we can see it ourselves and understand clearly what is the actual state of things, especially when it comes to matters of eternal significance like the condition of our soul to know whether or not we have a true saving faith. So James describes such a faith, and the faith he describes, this saving faith, is not invisible. We've talked about faith, and people lots of the time talk about faith. That's something that you can divide from the rest of your life. No, saving faith is not invisible, but it is, in fact, observable. You can see it. It's observable, indicating that what is that it is real because it is on display, and it is observable to ourselves and to others. If the evidence is present, this affirms your faith. If the evidence is absent, the lack has been mercifully identified so that we can give attention to and prioritize this. That is an effective form of communication to break through self-deception. I need to look at the mirror of God's word and see myself clearly. And in these, verse, in these verses, James for, provides us examples so that we can see it ourselves. Last week, we looked in verse 14, we looked at the benefit of faith, the claim of faith, the outworking of faith, and the power of faith. And then asking, does verse 14 describe a saving faith? Now, James leads us to consider the effect of faith. The effect of faith. How does he do so? Oh, you ready to have your toes stepped on? Here we go. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can such a faith save him? And where does James go from here? What's the next thing he goes into? Immediately, he goes from our personal faith, our personal faith, to its expression in caring for others. Now, you might hear that, and you're like, yeah. And, I'll, and that just jumped out to me. Perhaps only subconsciously, do you know how we often think of faith? We think that faith is for me. Faith is for me. I wrote no in your notes there, just to be clear that that's not the way it's supposed to be. But in the scenario presented with a stated faith without any known outworking, can that kind of faith save him? There's a, there's a notable concern, understandably so, for one's own soul, for my own soul. But that will bring about an out-of-balance perspective that leads us to be self-centered rather than self-sacrificing. It seems a very subtle thing, but it really does lead to that. 
a concern with self leads us to be self-centered rather than self-sacrificing. Selfishness being concerned with self primarily and almost very nearly exclusively. And I'm standing up here, and I'm here to talk to you all about selfishness, and I'm aware of the fact that I'm thinking about myself all the time. Boy, that's hard. And, and even as I was going through this and I was studying through it uh, throughout the week, I was aware of the fact that there was an underlying assumption that I was operating under. And, and the Holy Spirit brought this to my attention. Uh, because I was quite a ways into my studying and 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 this change that the Holy Spirit in in causing me to see this differently, it transformed the way I have looked at this passage and allowed it to do a work in my heart. Because as I concern myself with Ethan working out his own salvation with fear and trembling, Philippians two twelve, and now I'm trying to teach you to think and do the same, to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But it rather jumped out to me that how quickly this passage, even in the way that I was approaching it, how quickly this passage can turn into being all about me. My salvation. My eternal destiny. My assurance. My comfort. Yet such selfish motivation is out of step with the passage that emphasizes selfless expression. Selfless expression. And selfishness, again, this is one of those things I, I mean, I read it, I even taught it, so I know it, right? But as I'm going through this, I'm like, oh, wow. I'm running everything through the filter of me. Can, can, that, can that sort of faith save him? Which makes it very individual, right? But then the next verse, where does it go? To others. And that's where the expression, so faith is not just for me. And, and selfishness is, is another underlying problem that James continues to highlight, as he did earlier in the letter. I don't believe that the Holy Spirit... I didn't hear any audible voice. You don't need to be concerned. But I found it very interesting because I was, this this thought came in my head, oh, wow, I'm being totally selfish with the way I'm looking at this. And it was though the Holy Spirit is like, yeah, I remember I said that earlier. And this selfishness thing is a thread that gets picked up again. James brought it up before as he will uh, highlight earlier concepts and then bring them back into play because, you know, we already read it, therefore we're already doing it, right? Nope. And so he continues to go about addressing these deeper, deeper issues of the heart that continue to need to be worked out with each emerging situation. So James, again, combats this propensity toward selfish motivation. He did so at the end of chapter 1 by aligning pure religion expressed through the care given to orphans and widows. And then in the beginning of chapter 2, identifying the self-serving practice of catering to the rich. And all of these things, believing that faith is for me and operating with self-centered concern. When we do that, This is what happens. It directs the way we approach, the way we approach others, the way we approach church, the way we even approach God. It'll direct the way we approach others. Do I see others through the lens of a biblical faith? Do I see the unsaved as captives who are blinded by lies? Or... Do I see them as people I'm against because of their lifestyle, because of their political stances? 
when I the the approach the the way that I think of fellow believers. Uh, do fellow believers do they need to mind their p's and q's around me because I'm prone to being offend, offended? All, all of these things that if we believe faith is for me, it affects things. It affects the way we look at others. It affects the way we look at church. Do I expect to have things in my church to align with my per my preferences? And this even comes down to the way we approach God himself. If we believe that faith, along with everything else, centers on me and is here to advantage me. And I wonder about all of this as I consider the state of my eternal soul. And here's some tough questions. How is such a response any different than any other unsaved, self-serving, good person. How does the attitude, how does that attitude reflect a life that's been changed by the gospel? In fact, what about our perspective and response is quite the opposite because of the gospel? And how different would our perspective be if we thought in terms of being saved for service? Rather than faith is for me, which is self-centered rather than self-sacrificing, what if I thought in terms of being saved for service? Because that would shape our expectations of others, that we'd be desiring to live out the gospel out of concern for others, that the lost might might know about Jesus Christ, that when I look at fellow believers that it would be not critiquing, not critiquing them, but actually seeking to care for my brothers and sisters in Christ. It would change the way that I look at the church, for we would look how we can serve rather than be served. Have you heard that before? Yeah, the, the one that we claim to follow, he's the one who said that he did not come to be served, but to serve. It'll change the way that we look at God himself and we'll live a life of expressed love and gratitude to God for the gift of salvation. Saved for service in the expectation, uh, saved for service is the expectation found in Ephesians 2. Saved by faith for good works. Saved by faith for good works. They're together. They're not in conflict. They're together. So we consider the effect of faith. And right after, right after bringing up, can such a faith save him, James goes into our care not for ourselves but for others. And not just anyone but the destitute the ones to whom I will need to give of myself. It will be costly. It's quite the opposite end of the spectrum of the rich, tying to what the scenario James put forward early in the chapter, from whom I would expect to get. So now we're looking at, okay, my faith is going to cause me to give rather than to get. So quite different expectation that comes from having received and being changed by the gospel. So James goes on to uncover another layer of our ingrained selfishness through the following example. Verse 15, if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food. This is a real situation here. Again, touching on the care for the needy that's addressed at the end of chapter 1 and continuing the beginning of chapter 2. He uses the terms brother or sister, uh, likely inferring to that these may even be believers. But these are legitimate, fundamental needs. This is here describing providing what is lacking what is lacking in these things are necessary things. So don't think in terms of, of this in terms of a, the availability of, 
socialized systems like we have in our day where we can say, oh, you should go to this place and they will help you. Those are nice and those are good services to have available, but the fulfilling of such needs really should be a Christian thing. Hospitals, orphanages, relief work, the abolition of slavery, missions to the unreached, all of these are Christian in their roots and in their motivation. Changed by the gospel, having trusted in Jesus Christ, being for, having your sins forgiven, being at peace with God, given a new heart, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, so much so that these ones are never the same. Saul became Paul. He went from persecuting the church to loving and giving and suffering for her. The reality of many of our social services have been assumed by the government, that's true, but that does not absolve us of our responsibility to be personally involved seeking to help. But neither should the physical needs of others supersede, nor should philanthropy overshadow the concern we give to their souls. And that's we're very prone to do that. We, we can kind of have... Uh, I know I've talked to Gloria. You can let know, Gloria know that I mentioned her from up front just because she can be really embarrassed about it. Um, but I talked to Gloria about that with the Salvation Army. That, that, that's very much become, uh, that, that's where you go for help rather than this being a thing of, yes, we provide help, but the concern, the main concern, the ultimate need is spiritual. Their physical needs are legitimate, and a reality that when provided, show the gospel that is spoken. It shows the gospel that is spoken. Years ago, I remember having a conversation with, with Pastor James. And he said, if a man were 75 feet offshore drowning, a Democrat's approach would be to throw 100 feet of rope into the water, but not hold on to the other end. A Republican's approach would be to throw out 50 feet of rope, hold on to the end, and call, if you do your part, I'll pull you in. With the end result being the guy drowns because neither actually helped him. And this is reflective, and it's re reflected as the passage continues. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says, one of you says to him, depart in peace, be warmed and filled. That, that's the right answer. But it is an intellectual solution. It is an intellectual solution. That is the correct goal, but it stayed in your head, or at best it merely left your mouth. James goes on, but you did not give him the things which are needed for the body. You haven't done them any good. May it never occur, but let's say that one of our, one of our dear ushers one day gets the mother of all paper cuts and severs a finger. So you come upon this bloody scene and you declare, you know, that would bleed less if the finger were connected to the body. What is needed at the time is not counsel from Captain Obvious. What, what is needed is for you to grab a finger, grab a towel, and get him to the hospital. That's actually what's needed. Is that too gory for a Sunday morning? There's still plenty of time before lunch. One of you says 
to them. Saying, but not doing. James is pointing out all these things. These things are in isolation, and they don't work in isolation. Saying, but not doing. Knowing the right answer, giving them the right answer. You can even put that on a bumper sticker. Jesus is the answer. There you go. You're an evangelist. No. Knowing the right answer, giving him the right answer, but doing nothing to help, which is a demonstrated failure to love your neighbor as yourself, which is what James covered in the previous section. What good is it that you know what needs to be done if you don't do what needs to be done? Who has helped then? The destitute remains destitute. The unmoved one remains unmoved. Nothing changed. Though I could be self-deceived into thinking that somehow I have done something to help because I knew the right answer. But James asked this question there at the end. What does it profit? That returns to our earlier question of the benefit of faith. What is the benefit of faith? Thus delivering a grim diagnosis of the presence of a legitimate faith. Nothing changed. Nothing was affected. If this were a science experiment, that would be called a failed experiment. Why would it be a failed experiment? Nathan, you might go into the sciences. Why would that be considered a failed experiment? Is Nathan... Speak through the internet to me, Nathan. Why would we call that a failed experiment? Because it didn't work. It didn't work. The catalyst, the catalyst, that which is to bring about a result, the catalyst was ineffective. Or perhaps a placebo. Who would have thought you'd have placebo for a fill-in-the-blank? P-L-A-C-E-B-O, placebo. Placebo. Why? For no one was helped. I found this definition of a placebo. A placebo is a medicine prescribed for the psychological benefit. Psychological, where does that stay? Psychological benefit in the mind subjectively in the mind rather than the physiological effect. That's what Abby's going into, dealing with the body, stuff that actually is. Hey, if you do this thing, it moves that thing. Where it is objectively real. So in short, such thinking furthers the idea that faith is merely for my benefit. And James comes along and makes the argument that that faith that, that makes you feel all warm and fuzzy, it doesn't exist. It's not real. It's false. And it does not save. Thus, also, faith by itself, verse 17, if it does not have works, is dead. James addresses those who confidently say they have faith, but their conduct debunks that claim. The Apostle Paul addresses those who have their externals in order. They're doing lots of good stuff, but their faith is in their works, not in Christ. So both of these men are challenging the concepts of their readers regarding a faith that actually saves. Verse 18, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. So here we have the either or argument. The either or argument. Either you have faith or you have works. Either or. You have faith implying that you have faith to the exclusion of works. But James would question if that is a true faith or if it is a faith that is imagined 
imagined. It's in your head only. Imagined. Yet there is this counting, countering perspective as the verse continues, verse 18. Show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. Now that is a strong argument for deeds accompanying faith. This is the both and response. It's not an either or, but it's both and. We are saved by faith for good works. Both and. And as we noted earlier, faith is not invisible but observable, here describing a faith that is exhibited. It is not imagined, but it is exhibited. It is on display. And I think about these things, and I say, what other arena of life do we expect a claim to be void of proof? If CJ and Alex were sitting there, CJ sitting there, if I looked at CJ and Alex and say, I believe I could beat you in an arm wrestle. Now, if Alex was sitting there, Alex would say, hmm, okay. If CJ was sitting there, which he is, and I'm staying up here, um, CJ would say, would you care to test that theory? Do you know what the expectation would be? That you prove it. If I say, no, 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 I, I think I think I think what I've said is proof enough. Now all of you can go off and say, Ethan as well as beat CJ in a in an arm wrestle. That that's not the way it works. We look at that and we say, that is a laughable example. That is a laughable thing to say, but yet the reality is that so many securely hang their eternity upon a claim that has no evidence. And thankfully, God provides us in his word through James a corrective word. James describes here a saving faith that there's been a change inside through belief and trust in Jesus Christ that has transformed and is observed on the outside. As we come to the communion table, I, I remind us of the words of the great hymn. Jesus paid it, what? All. Dear people, do not get in your head. You know I did this. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. There's not a bit of this that promotes working our way to heaven. We can't do it. We're not good enough. God the Father looked at his son and he said, Here is my son in whom I am well pleased when we trust in his son and the sacrifice of his son, that God the Father looks at us and is pleased because he sees the righteousness of his son. And he sees us not holding on to our own goodness, but trusting in the goodness of the Savior. This is not about good deeds winning our favor with God. No, not a single bit by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. But faith is not alone. Saving faith will be evidenced with fruit, revealing the work of God in your life. And so we have before us this, this litmus test, and if it troubles you, because there's you look at your own life and there are indicators that make you wonder whether or not you're saved, receive this help. Do you have a doubting mind that leaves you unstable? James addressed that in James 1, 6 through 8. Do your emotions, 
Do your drives, do your desires draw you away into sin and develop in you a heart that is cool toward God? James addresses that in chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Or do you look at your life and you see a lack of fruit? Does that describe you? Are you troubled by that? James would say, you should. You should be troubled by that. But here's the thing. Talk to God about it. That, that's what we get to do. We get to approach him. Let's not make this complicated. We might as well be honest with him about it because he knows it anyway. Don't make it complicated. Keep it plain and simple. Let me read you this from Isaiah 55, 6 through 7. Here's some good counsel. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. To clarify, that doesn't mean that he's going anywhere. But we can certainly move decidedly away from him. And if I'm at the point where I care, that's the time to act. If, if my heart is becoming so cool toward God that I'm getting to the point where I don't care anymore, th then, that, then that's like lights flashing, major problem. But what do I do if that describes me? What if I'm even to the point where I don't care? Verse 7 says, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Stop doing it. Stop, stop thinking about that thing that turns you away from the Lord. Stop doing that which turns you away from the Lord. The Bible calls that repentance. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. I'm always fascinated by we always refer to it as the prodigal son. You had the prodigal son who went away, and you had the prodigal son who stayed. You had, you had the, he, he stayed there. He was in the right place, but his heart was hard, and he thought he was good. And the son who was away had to come to the point where he, he realized he'd made a mess of things. And he says, maybe my father will receive me. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon him. Turn away from yourself to him. And trust in the Savior anew in your, at the at Calvary, um, there's some helpful things for to, you to read through. Maybe, uh, maybe while the elements are being passed out, if you, if you need help thinking these things through, uh, there's some good counsel there for you. But, dear people, this is, this is what we do at times like this. Oh, wow. Man, I really hope I'm saved. Here's a question. Do you believe? Do you believe? Present tense. I didn't say, look in your Bibles to see if you wrote down a date when you decided something. Do you believe right now? Then trust him right now. Be saved right now. And come to the table as we enjoy time together as God's children. Men, would you come forward? David, you thank the Lord for his body. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your broken body that you lovingly presented to the Father so that we might walk with you and know you. Help us to remember that and enjoy it. 
In Christ's name, amen. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's do so together. pray before the cup. Lord, we thank you for this time of remembrance, this time of communion together as a church family, and uh, we thank you that Jesus Christ willingly shed his blood, and through that blood we have forgiveness of sins. Uh, we've been reconciled to you, and we have peace with you through that blood. We thank you for this in your name.
the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Let's do so together. I think we'll just, maybe we'll stand and let's recite the Lord's Prayer together. And you can sing Jesus Paid It All in the car on the way home. Let's pray as our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The usher